Welcome to Joyful Sober. This is a series of conversations with creative and inspiring people who think the topic of giving alcohol a bit less power and attention might be worth having a chat about. So I'm Alison Lassick and I've got the absolute pleasure of meeting Philip Adams, the artistic director of Philip Adams Ballet Lab, a company he formed upon returning home from New York in 1998. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are listening in to our chat today. So, yeah, I'm really excited about this conversation. I think it's going to be qu quite an interesting one. It's gonna, um, I'm really keen to hear about Philip's story as a highly conscious non-drinker but also his incredible career in dance and performance, which spans more than 25 years um, and has made a huge impact on Australian art and culture in that time. And interestingly, his company is located in a hall that was built by one of the influential temperance movements in um, 1863. So we might even get to talk a little bit about that history as well. So yeah, Philip, it's great to welcome you onto Joyful Sober. How are you? Oh, thank you, Alison. This is terrific to have this conversation and highly unexpected. And, uh, you know, I am a non-drinker, so we will get to that later. But the fact that, um, as you said earlier, my studio, Temperance Hall, is in fact an institutional um, piece of architecture and a landmark one for total abstinence society that formed in uh, the 1800s in Melbourne. It's kind of ironic. So, so interesting. We'll later. So it's lovely to meet you and to talk to you today in your program. You too. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Um, I actually heard from mm. Ty Snaith, who was on the show previously, um, who's an artist in Melbourne, that you would be uh, a hot tip of a person to speak to. <laughs> so there's lots of um, interested people out there to hear, particularly about the, yeah, the, the meeting of those two stories and histories. Who would have thought? Yeah, yeah. So to kick things off, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a non-drinker? Like, was that something that happened naturally in your line of work as a, a performer or was it more of a hurdle um, getting, you know, making that transition? I wish it was something really like juicy and compelling and kind of um, in a way that it uh, could mark my life out in alcoholism, but it's not. Uh, at an early age, look, I got to trace back to teenage, you know, teenage days. And um, my first introduction to alcohol was at my um, brother's um, party that he had had uh, um, when he'd left home and I would go to those parties. And I remember getting really drunk for the first time and throwing up on the front lawn. This is typical, I'm 15 here, typical teenage moment on red cheap wine of all things and so that I, I remember this moment distinctly Alison as life-changing I was crook for days afterwards and you know as a teenager I'd certainly bounce back like that <laughs> and the next day feel nothing and go to my job on Saturday morning at Woolies to pack the shelves and not even know but um I didn't I was really worn down and felt weak and quite ill so I had another crack at it and this um, at another party, I remember going after school to a friend's house and getting really drunk. And again, the same thing happened. So it turns out that I'm allergic to alcohol in the way that it just does not agree with my body. And this particular enzyme that I produce when I consume alcohol um, makes me really crook and feel ill. So, um, and you know, and the, you know, I won't say too much more about it, but I still tempt myself sometimes just to test out whether this is still in fact the reason why I don't drink. And it is. The minute I sniff the cork, I literally fall over backwards. Wow. And I don't like the feeling. And then, um, just to add a little bit more to the story, I'm nearly done. I noticed that I felt this, I, I, I started to become anxious when I drank alcohol, this feeling of being out of control. And I didn't like that destable uh, emotion and experience that it would conjure up when I was drinking alcohol. So I made the decision at 21 to stop drinking. And I've not had a touch drop since. Amazing. That's, um, that's pretty cool. That is a good story. 
it's not that cool, but it's interesting <laughs> that really young, you know, getting yeah. in the front garden and throwing up on the lawn and realizing that, you know, I'm really, something's going on here and visiting the doctor going, I actually really have a violent reaction to alcohol in your bloodstream and it's not agreeing with you. Mm. That's it. And it kind of, that's the end of that story. Yeah, it's interesting because then you've been through, you know, most the majority of your 20s without it in a way. So you get all those other great benefits of, um, you know, not have, have being dragged back physically exactly. or mentally. By... I don't even think about it, Alice, in a mm. sober life. Like, I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm in my late 50s and I, I feel that, you know, I've not missed out on anything. In fact, I've been quite focused. If, mm. <laughs> if it, you know, to put, to put you know, uh, a wager on that moment in life, I've been very focused about, you know, my career and what I've done because I have always, you know, been the one at the party with were given the keys to drive people home. This comes with responsibility. Yeah. A non-drinker has a responsibility for others. Yeah, making sure everyone gets home safely and, um, yeah, being in control, you will probably be quite popular. <laughs> mm. Yeah, still am. It doesn't go away. No. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's quite cool. Um, and I guess interestingly, like, you know, you might not realise the impact that it has, but it seems as though it hasn't been a distraction, just hasn't been there. It probably allows you to get on with making your creative work and following what what is meaningful and passionate in your life. That is true, sobering in other ways, but also it's it allowed my work to be freed up. And it's, it's kind of an interesting maybe moment to move into the work, Alice, because, mm. you know, um, I, am, I have a reputation for being quite outrageous and my work being disobedient and sort of not following the rules in the way that um, I laid that down very early uh, when I started making work as a choreographic artist in 1998 after 10 years of living in New York and uh, the first work I made was called Amplification and it premiered at the for those listeners who are of a certain ilk who do remember the Ath 2 on Collins Street it was a performance space um, above the Athenaeum 1 the theatre and mm. a lot of contemporary dance was presented up there um, this work was about car accidents and not the best topic to be working against in the way that it could have been this sort of moment where we've seen the body in trauma, the body in chaos, and how that's influenced, it was influenced by the book by J.G. Ballard, Crash, and how to see the body in this sort of very um, trauma, state of trauma. It relates back, I think, also to a conversation earlier in my work, um, uh, in my life and in my work, um, relative, that is, of when I was young, I was hit by a car, by a drunk driver. Oh, wow. Now, this is really interesting. We could link some kind of conversation that comes into play here. Um, I was brought up in Papua New Guinea, in the Highlands, in Garoka and Ley, and then later moved to Port Moresby. This is in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, preschool, ran out into the pedestrian crossing, you know, unbeknownst, a car clicked knocked me sideways and I don't remember the accident myself, but um, I was four. The driver um, was drunk. Yes. And so that was yeah. an interesting way to kind of relate my work back to this moment of the accident and seeing it in reflection from childhood memory and piece together in my first major full length work in 1999. So there's been this kind of association with non-drinking reaction to alcohol you could put in play that's allowed my work to be the way i see it is this sort of very turbulent and disobedient and mannering in the way that i react to violence and mm. um in a social in a so in a social conversation with life and contemporary dance and performance and art yeah wow it's so interesting that you can trace those ties like mm. obviously when non-drinking is probably not a topic of conversation that you have all the time but there are threads through your work right yes. to the beginning. I yeah. think so yeah that in a good steady diet of being brought up catholic i think there's a lot of conversation to be had in that yeah. as well but this <laughs> is kind of like we could go into the whole idea of wine and the body of christ mm. and knowledge to which alcohol you know it's you know is served as a way as a, of transformation. So, you know, we consume the body and bloody of Christ through the host, but we also know that, you know, we drink the wine as the, the blood of Christ as well. Mm. So these like euphemisms and kind of 
um, the sort of forever fantastic Catholic fantasy or the melodrama to which, you know, these epic stories of the Bible growing up as a Catholic played out. Wow, There's yeah. There's a conversation always that surrounded the idea of alcohol as a social occasion and a celebration because both my parents are really heavy drinkers. <laughs> and it kind of contradicts again everything about this weighing up about how my work is produced and my reaction to being a non-drinker. But the, when you look at the work, you think, oh, wow, this, this really must be made in under the condition of the artist being very um, vulnerable or fragile to something in life that's effective or has affected them. Yeah, yep, very personal. Um, personal yeah, so interesting what you say as well, just to go back to the body of Christ. Um, I've been reading some poetry from Rumi, the Sufi mystic, and he also uses like it. alcohol as a kind of metaphor for transformation, I guess, spiritual transformation. So yeah, it's like kind of connected to those bigger, higher it realms is. as well. Yeah. And then getting there in a more kind of conscious way without alcohol is like maybe that's right where, yeah. where we go that's with right. a clear mind. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah, I think about, you know, my work is definitely has a sort of religiosity to it or the devotion or the, the task of um, worship and ceremony, which is very driven by Catholicism and my early introduction, childhood, um, yeah, being raised a Catholic. And I can see where those threads around community come together in a gathering uh, and a celebration. And as we probably move into Temperance Hall, that conversation shortly, it makes total sense that my work is made there. Yes. It's the yes. new church to which <laughs> I can preach <laughs> my, in my high, in high modernity. Yes. The ideal of my work <laughs> being kind of almost preacherly at the same time, um, really abstain abstained. Because mm, it's a really grand space, but then it's also got that history as well, um, which maybe we can shift over into that as well. But yeah, how did you end up situating your company within Temperance Hall? Um, if you could maybe take us back to the start. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, as you were saying earlier, and thanks for the introduction, that I, um, preview to um, settling back in Australia. I lived in New York for 10 years through the 80s and 90s. That's another story. And uh, when I came back to Australia in 98, uh, I formed Ballet Lab, my company, which is ironic to be calling my, you know, a classical laboratory <laughs> of experiments. And so um, looking at uh, my trajectory for that next 15 years of learning how to write grants, learning, you know, to, to self-taught business skills <laughs> and being entrepreneurial in the mannering that I could uh, start to think about forming an organisation and a board, I did, um, yeah, roll with the punches and experiment with the everyday in order to find myself uh, running an organisation called Ballet Lab. And we existed as an independent. We were usually at home on a computer and an email until we found a little space at the Victorian College of the Arts, which was lovely for a while. The Australian Ballet, this is a weird moment, harboured me for a while and took me in as they were renovating the building on the sixth floor. Um, now the Temperance Hall. Wow, this is this was a very this is a milestone moment, it's a life changing moment here. How does an organisation independently emerge from being an email to actually a venue? Mm. And, um, I I used to rehearse at the Temperance Hall in the early noughties, and I've made a lot of work there, and it was a pretty rundown, dingy old space that had you know was not on its last legs, but it was coming close to being condemned. There's holes in the floor, there was no heating, <laughs> but we loved it. And it has a very colourful history and past, which we can talk about uh, shortly. Um, the tender came up for a new tenant in the building because it was discovered that the Temperance Hall is in fact on Crown land. It's not heritage listed that the Temperance movement were really smart, Alison. They actually signed a deed to the city of Port Phillip to say that the land and the building be handed over to the Victorian state government of statutory around land um, deeds, or I can't remember what the, the quite terminology is, that the building be protected as crown land and be used only for the purpose of community and culture. Mm. So working heritage, 
this is very important organisation in Victoria who have a great portfolio of um, buildings that they have preserved and protected over the years, such as La Mama. Well, ah, yep. down, but also New La Mama, the courthouse, yep. Hoity Hall, Traders Hall. They even uh, have uh, properties now in regional Victoria, such as the Warwick Neville Courthouse. So they take care of or custodian these fantastic Victorian buildings, which were established in the 1800s, and convert them to cultural spaces. And artists are positioned in them. I put my hand up and I applied for the. I put in a tender overnight. And it was dreadful, Alison, let me tell you now. It was an overnight rush job because someone said, hey, Philip, you know, this is up for grabs. And I went, what? <laughs> You've got to be joking. As if I would be, you know, considered for this. So I, I wrote a really outrageous, as one would expect from me, um, pitch. And they called me up and went, I think we've found our tenant. Amazing. <laughs> they were like, we've never come across a more outrageous proposition <laughs> in our lives but that's what we want because they also see this temperate this word to, you know to to be absolute aim for purity and abstinence you are the most untemperate person we know but we would you would bring a soul and a new life and a substance to this building that i think it needs resuscitate that it needs the revival um so it's interesting you know to place that when we fast forward track here i got it was a very competitive round, apparently. Um, they had hundreds and hundreds of applications, architects, graphic design firms, restaurants. You know, the building is amazing. Um, temperance society, culture, community. Amazing. I sat 3% of performing arts organisations that had it. So it came down to, you know, a handful of people. And so, you know, I had a great board with a lot of really cool architects on it. And, already to convince and put forward a really great proposition that I uh, be custodian of the building. I got it in 2016. Um, a lot of a, a lot of financing, financing has gone into the preservation of the building and um, renovation, refurbishing it from Working Heritage and brought it up today to being a cutting edge venue, venue for experimental and hybrid interdisciplinary performance and art. It's amazing. They've really gone sort of the opposite of temperance, haven't they, with the art that they're sort of allowing to be in the space. It's quite and a nice marriage. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't actually until the mid-2000s did the covenant get lifted, ah. which is interesting. It's still been part of the covenant of non-alcohol, no, no alcohol served on premises, was there until, well, certainly who has obeyed that rule because we know Ant Hill Theatre was the main custodian of the building all through the 80s and into the early 90s. The Australian Nouveau Theatre, Antil Theatre, was there. And uh, Jean-Pierre Mignon was the director of Antil Theatre, and he was really cutting edge in his day. I mean, this was a, one of Australia's first experimental theatre companies. And so to, there's always had this colourful history in the building. Even there was a bird preservation wildlife society in there for a while. And the South Melbourne Football Club was formed in there in 1878. Now wow. known as Sydney Swans. Like it has this, and now me. So if you kind of fast track the conversation from social dances, you know, to reform, to um, protection and community and gathering and dances and social events, to, to my company, Ballet Lab, it seems quite befitting, after all, that we continue the legacy to which the house has always been, that the hall, the house, um, a coven for people who need protection and who need space and a safe space to present, perform and make and create and desire to be, you know, who they want to be. And the word temperate for me is perfect because it makes me focus. Everyone that works in there, and I kid you not, go, there's something about this building which just makes you hone in on that internet, that intonation to which is very much part of the creative genuity of artists that strive to find deeper meaning in their practice and in their work. The mm. temperance provides that outlet and that vehicle because it has no distraction. That's incredible. So you feel that energy in the space, perhaps? I do. And, yeah. Yeah, minute, I've, I've, every, yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in the various studios in creating and making, especially the upstairs studio, which was where the Temperance Society held their meetings. And the windows architecturally are designed above the eye line, so there's no distraction when they met, so they could see skyward towards God, which is very interesting. And so there was, again, 
this whole idea of abstaining and being pure when even their thoughts at the social meetings were always clear. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's incredible when, you know, the architecture actually even creates, helps mm. create that energy as well. And it doesn't surprise me the environment and that history is a, a great place to focus on, on your performance work. Mm. Yeah. So one thing like fascinates me about this temperance hall, um, you know, just a bit of backdrop. It was mm -hmm. built in you know, on Napier street in South Melbourne in 1863. Uh, and the current building was completed in 1888. So there was two parts to the building. And so from the beginning, um, it was a key site for performing arts and hosting meetings, as we said earlier, lectures and dances and concerts and theatrical performance dating back that far. And so the first hall, which is at the front, which uh, was in great demand. And in, I think it was 1874, a brick replacement was built at the back that's the actual hall and um, that was to accommodate more activity and then by 1880 the hall was able to accommodate up to 400 people and in 1888 they built the double story lodge um, where the chief ruler lived at the front um, so the alcohol free they were for the temperance society was for alcohol free entertainment and that was a vital part of promoting the movement um, as was a healthy physical activity. So the mm. South Melbourne, as I said, the football club was formed in there, uh, which was incredible. And while the abstinence um, sounds quaint today, well, abstinence does sound quaint today, in 1854, the Emerald Hill Total Abstinence Society was part of a worldwide movement that aimed to stamp out domestic violence. And it was a proto-feminist agenda that mm. saw mostly male alcohol consumption as the cause for social harm for with women and children as um, as the victims. So to conclude this, it's interesting to sort of note that the movement provided a very vital political outlet for women. Um, and by the 19th century, the temperance organisations were promoting causes such as women's higher education, physical education for girls, mm. free kindergartens, equal play for equal work, protective laws for women and children and in the workforce, uh, reform of laws on marriage and divorce and shelter for abused mothers. So talk about ahead of their time. Yeah, wow. They were like, they were the business. They were amazing. Yeah, it's, in a way, it's really interesting that uh, there's a movement there that uh, addressing domestic violence and other issues caused by alcohol by encouraging people to abstain. Like, it seems as though no one will listen to that. And yet, you know, they've got members and um, probably a thriving community uh, and um, a, a space to meet and gather. It's super interesting, Alison, mm. what you're saying. Like, let's transport that. Let's transform that um, quickly to the present. How does that translate? Like, we've got to think about this moment. You'll come into our lodge if you take the pledge. You have to say that you will not drink and you will give us your money and, we, like, you know, we will give you clothes and shelter and protect you. And where does that, where does that language translate today in this sort of modern society where we do have shelters and we do have places and we do have places to go dry it up in clinics and, you know, and to rehab. But yeah. they were, for, in many respects, they were the rehab of the past. This is really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Think about how modern they were, they were even though, and they were non-denominational. They weren't preaching God. They were not preaching the way of the Bible and Jesus and the way Presbyterian or Catholic or whatever. I think, I'm not sure what denomination they were, but they were really about finding that moment where um, this, the Emerald Hill Society was rife with gin and beer. I mean, it would flood the streets because the water was, you couldn't drink the water. Oh, so you, yeah. Gin and beer was your healthy option. Poison. And so they really were smart in building that hall, right? Smack bang. On Boomerang land, may we just have that moment and talk about it smack bang in the middle uh, and plop themselves down. So this, it's a fascinating history. To the left of the building um, back then was an orphanage that the Catholics were on the left. They're the boys' orphanage and the girls' orphanage, which is a really, you know, harrowing 
another conversation about this history in Melbourne also of orphanages and abuse. But the in the middle of it was interesting because they also protected children and brought them into the hall from the orphanages at times of violence and also abuse to alcohol. Yeah, wow. So, so interesting to have that in the space where you're working now. And can you tell me about what your what currently is um, things that are happening in your world? We're in lockdown here in Melbourne at the moment and we're not actually in this space. I guess I'm curious to hear how it's all going and what maybe you've got coming up as we start to emerge out of our homes. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Alison. It's interesting how to think about, you know, coming back to mm. the Temperance Hall, my space, and to champion what I was so hell-bent on achieving and a vision and a mission and a direction when I took the space to then be cut off at the knees <laughs> by COVID's wrath. And so what this entry for me feels like coming back into what would be a new normal is really fragile, you know. I do feel like it's, it's I, there is a moment of, of being in my own rehab, mental, physically and emotionally. We all have. And I have found that um, I'm more aware of the importance of camaraderie mm. and to share that language, even though it's been god awful on you know Zoom, a Zoomathon. I've had to teach on Zoom and I've had to experience that sort of exchange synthetically, not human to human. How important it is for bonding, for humankind to have touch, to waltz together, mm. and to be social together. And so the hall for me, I'm seeing this call as I come back as a way to be in arms again. And I like the idea of this sort of more um, oh, context around the hall forming in 1886, what that emotion was like for people to finally have a safe space in a shelter to move to waltz and to dance to socialise together. And I'm looking forward to that slow burn with my community of artists, particularly those from the LGBTQI arts practitioners and communities at large that love also the hall and share in that as a safe space of making creation to foster that program, to foster those communities and to ensure that I look after my local sheriff. Let's face it, Alison, it's going to be a long time until my work is seen again internationally. Mm. So I want to devote all that energy and time into supporting my local artists, people here in Melbourne, and ensure that the livelihood of their work is protected and nurtured because it's been really neglected and they're hurt. Yeah, it's and been so a hard having... time over the last year and a half. Mm, yeah. yeah. But it's my best foot forward and my job now to ensure that those artists um find a longer dialogue with sustained practice as opposed to in and in out we've got you know midsummer festival we have melbourne fringe festival we have the melbourne um international film festival there we've got a lot of festivals that use and coming out of the space and all of a sudden it's become a cool space to have your work show in there which i never thought it would be cool but apparently it offers that alternative space to where you can't where other work can't be seen Temperance Hall fills that space where, you know, there's a um, work that's often difficult to talk about and challenging, not for us. Temperance has an open door policy, which is great. Yeah, um, nice. Getting back to the alcohol thing, I mean, I could talk about that recovery from COVID in infinitum, and I'm sure we all will. As we can now feel it about to, you know, be the gate's going to be finally open and we can find ourselves again being terrified by going back into you know, the daily commute. Um, it's interesting when we do have parties there and social events, there's a lot of them. We have queer parties, queer time, queer play. We also have fundraisers. We also make films in there and video clips and photo shoots. And the first question I'm asked is, are you allowed to drink in here, Philip? <laughs> and I went, so, I, you know, I never say yes or no. I say... It's up to you. And that makes it a bit awkward, but mm. I love the conversation. And it's not at all I'm against alcohol. Not at all. But I just like putting that um, gesture forward as the director of the space to have the history of the Temperance Society on it in some yeah. ways. But also go, and then they have this moment of, oh, a lot of horrors go, oh, 
maybe we shouldn't or is there a, is would it be offensive if we did or not at all it's just up to you it's interesting so isn't it because it's all yeah it's always up to you however sometimes maybe we don't feel like that because uh, you know it's so much a part of all other events especially in the arts and maybe we don't realize it's it is up to us it <laughs> it's is up to us it's like oh so we'll run the bar and we'll make two thousand bucks out of it great so that'll be distributed to the artist in, in you know their fringe program and they'll split half the box office but what if we didn't host the bar and serve the plonk and so there is this kind of always ongoing question which i really enjoy having about alcohol and consumption at the temperance hall as part of the ongoing legacy of the building yeah i love it super interesting and i guess i'm curious as well um i guess now and also into the future as we will reconnect with community um if you ever come across other non-drinkers in the arts and if there's anything that you sort of say to people who are interested in like pursuing a path where maybe they are wanting to drink less if you sort of what types of conversations you might start or, or what um, words of wisdom you have from a lifetime of experience <laughs> That's really interesting. It's very rarely do I come across non-drinkers. And when I do, I'm really blown away. I go, well, what's your journey? How did you arrive at, you know, no alcohol in your life? And then the story starts there. And there's an, um, there is a kind of awareness always when we see each other or have a few non-drinker friends. And there is a kind of secret code that we're non-drinkers. And, and it comes with also... Um, a quietness about that we don't talk about that or people will go oh philip he doesn't drink it's you know it's kind of weird that he doesn't i don't understand if you look at the work it's like it doesn't really quite make sense <laughs> but that's another, but um it's yeah i always find a um i'm able to share a discourse with them about my story why i don't drink or why i don't see it really as a as a, um, a hindrance on my life or, a, or you know in any capacity, but I'm always aware of the emotional impact that um, alcohol can have on somebody's life. And it can, we know, ruin, ruin your life. And um, in and in, in that, um, I'm, I'm always enamored with people that have chosen not to drink and curious as to why it's about recovery whether it's about sobriety or whether it is a meditation, or whether it is like me, just purely like, I just stopped drinking because I feel really bad and can't handle it and don't like the feeling and I feel crook. Mm. I think, that, you know, we all have a story to tell. And when sharing those stories, I feel really quite grounded. Yeah, um, grounded is definitely something that I've experienced. It was sort of an unexpected benefit of just feeling much more, um, I guess, purposeful and conscious of like what I'm doing with my life a bit more rather than just wasting time on a whole bunch of uh, things that are potentially irrelevant in the long run, hanging out with people who, um, you know, it's always nice when and I'm really looking forward to that when we get out of lockdown. But I guess just being a bit more conscious of where I want my energy to go and with what people mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing has been like a, a grounding experience of Absolutely. not drinking. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. And I, I think even like sharing us that story then, it, it brings me great joy <laughs> to know that. Yeah. <laughs> but let's go to a twist it off a moment just here when I've probably got a lot of time left. But I, I think, what if I did go out and get really pissed? What if I did go out and just have the wildest time and what would happen to me? But I've come so far now, I'm past that point where I feel there'd be a danger in that. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I don't see, I've never felt the desire to drink ever, not once. Yeah. To go out and have a, like a party. So after lockdown and I can, you know, we just have to look what's going on in Sydney, Manly, like the party. And I love watching the young people go ape, you know, and party on the beach. But I always think, also I say, Fair enough. There is a cause for celebration, but I wonder how we can take that, what we have been um, so, um, oh, it's the word I'm looking for, um, in isolation, what we've experienced and, you know, and a lot of, a lot of controversy, in, you know, as you know, depression and mental health issues and alcoholism is associated with isolation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that, conversation is going to look like as we come out of that and and share that language and those stories instead of like partying our ass off 
I wonder what sort of help or methoding it will, will, will be required also for those people who have suffered the isolation very much and, and um, yeah, and before going out and letting go and going and getting out of control, you know, each to their own. But it is, I'm curious to see what that freedom feels like and how that is experienced in the public domain. Yeah, yeah, I think it will be really interesting. Like you see our premier, both here and the new one in Sydney, um, you know, straight to a bar having beers to celebrate the end of lockdown. And I mean, I can completely understand that. And that was me when we came out of lockdown one and two as well. But I think maybe once the heat dies off of the, you know, the novelty factor, a lot of people been drinking much more over lockdown and maybe want to start thinking at some point that it might be time to moderate again. <laughs> I like this interesting, you're talking about like New Year's resolution. Yeah. Like, what's your COVID resolution to not drink anymore? <laughs> I'm not sure, but there should be. I think it's sort of comparable in that way. There's like, there's a new, um, an emotion and a new connection to the planet we all are going to have. It is never going to be the same. That is it. Mm. it in that way. And so, uh, and, and I'm all for change. I'm all for experiencing um, a fresh in my life because it brings about a conversation that was not there before. I learned something from it. So I think learning from this moment of coming out of isolation as a non-drinker, I'm also curious to experience what that is going to be like when I do go down the pub. And I love going on Friday nights to the pub. And I, I, you know, I, 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 and I love being with my friends who get really quite drunk on Friday nights. And I've always observed that. I've been the observer of it all of my life. I wonder how if that will be any different. I don't know. I'm not sure, but it's something to be uh, aware of. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting for sure. And um, I guess one of the things I finally ask, like as a, a kind of wrap up question, is just any tips or, you know, things that you might have to suggest to someone who might be thinking about pursuing a non drinking or drinking less path that you've come across in your journeys? Yes, this is an interesting question. It's about monitoring it. I mean, if you, it's, you know, sobriety, like, yeah, abstinence and sobriety. I think about this as something that's gradual. I think, you know, going cold turkey, it, what's the percentage of that ever working? It's very low. These things have to be gradual. And marking things along the way, like I went one week and this is how I felt. And that's diuretized, like you'd sort of monitor that and then mm -hmm. note that. And then in the second week, oh, I faltered, you know, this classic, like I fell off the wagon kind of thing. But, you know, someone entering that conversation, it's it's not a, it, it's about surrounding and yourself for me. I mean, I imagine I have a friend who wanted to give up drinking and attach themselves to me. And the entire time, you know, I was always going, well, you know, the option's up to you. I cannot, I cannot tell you to do this. I can't be the law-abiding citizen that tells you not to drink alcohol. But what I can do is be here to listen mm. to that. And so if it's, it's mark somebody who is always going to be there as the one to go, actually, I just can't do this. And they go, well, that's okay today, but tomorrow will be different. So it's never going to be a yes or a no answer at all you know and each of us has their own individual stories as to why we give up alcohol and for those that i know who have gone down that path and decided to not drink um i'm going to say that it is a very different conversation with the planet because mm. you what percentage of people are non-drinkers we don't i don't know the answer to that but when you're in a circle of people and you are a non-drinker you you are isolated you are the odd person out often and it's people are fascinated with that. And I see that, um, if you someone advice, as an advantage. You're unique. You've got something that someone else doesn't have. And there's no temptation there, which is a different way of looking at marrying a conversation with your relationship with the world, because it doesn't resolve coming down to holding a glass bottle in your hand. You're being really sustainable. You don't buy the tinny. Mm. <laughs> and look at it in a compartmental way of like sustainability that you're not contributing to waste. Yeah. So ways to kind of see this, you know, sort of crushing it under your foot and throwing it in the bin, whatever, and the cling cling of the bottles. You didn't contribute to that. 
It's so interesting to link the not drinking to sustainability. I guess um, not only do you have this sort of less rubbish, but potentially also cultivating just a more general awareness, you know, where we're up close and personal with ourselves and the planet as opposed to maybe taking the edge off or, or not noticing things as much. Yeah. A strange way to end on. Mm. My work, I, I think I'm going to assess my work the way that, my work is the way it is because I am a non-drinker. There is a radicalness in my work and I've, I've, I, that radicalness comes from temptation and all the temptations to which fall and consume and be part of me and coax that vision out of me are all about disobedience. It's about reaction to life. It's about being um, it's like the naughty child syndrome or seeing good in re replicating something they shouldn't. You can't touch it, so you will. There's always that temptation. And I think that's it's part of the way that I make is through the ideal that I am a non-drinker. And I find it really, not that I'm tempted to drink, but I like the idea of temptation. Because I'm mm. a non-drinker, I'm even more temptuous. I love it. Rich Joe. I will reverse the psychology on that, going down a fake Freudian moment there. But I think I could possibly argue that point that, you know, the person who is sober sees it clearer mm. and they see where the temptations can be rewarded in the way that they can be coaxed to be create more artistic, uh, artistically vibrant in the way they see the intonation of things um, with more... Um, yeah, I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but that's an yeah. interesting mode of looking at the way my work uh, and the desire for the queerness about my work becomes even queerer. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a I, radical, bold I'm, move, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Choosing not to drink and then, yeah, you've got that extra awareness and creative, like connection to that creative vision yeah. as well. Mm. Actually, I want to tell a quick story. Just yeah, go for it. Just, it just came to mind because it's actually quite um, pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, Go back, 19, early 90s somewhere, Pierce 122 New York, um, performing really avant-garde performance, cutting edge. Her dance, Jan Fabra, who's a very uh, classic European, um, celebrated performance artist. A lot of his dancers were in this work. It was by Dennis O'Connor. And I was asked to drink red wine in the work until I got really drunk and couldn't do the um, really technical demanding Cunningham-esque phrase material and cook a chicken nude with heel in heels for the audience. So this was a really outrageous avant-garde performance artwork. And uh, so I decided to do this. I forgot about this. You just brought it up. And so I had to drink enough wine until I almost passed out and performed a, and perform a ballet. And I remember doing this and I threw up on stage <laughs> and the piece was called Buckeye. So, of course, it's relevant to the theme of Euripides, you know, debauched. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I remember in this moment how upset I was for committing. I loved the choreographer. I, like I would do anything for this choreographer. So I thought, no, it's the art. So I will try to sever the idea of being a non-drinker for the purpose of art and it failed it didn't work i puked all over the stage i was wearing i was um at that time uh, a red velvet prop skirt i can't remember like a victorian skirt uh and then i had to be naked in heels afterwards and i was violently ill the entire work and the choreographer went, it was brilliant it's fantastic it was just so authentic i went yeah it was authentic because i was actually so crook and ill and passing out and felt anxious the whole time he goes you nailed it thank you could you do it tomorrow night in the next performance and i said no i could never <laughs> I do quit. It <laughs> so i suffered that moment of alcohol in order to give the artist what they wanted and go to great lengths so at least i can't fake it it was real for me in that moment and i will never do that again wow <laughs> <laughs> only in new york in the 90s right that was yeah yeah, and you've had that experience now to know how um, how different it is performing sober, I guess. <laughs> I wish it was on camera. We didn't have the big VHS. We didn't record it. I don't know. But anyway, that was part of my New York, um, yeah, my time in New York, which was great.
I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Philip. Um, such a cool conversation. And um, yeah, thanks for being on Joyful Sopa. Mm. Oh, you're welcome. And I think my last point in comment is, is it all about control? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, not being out of control. <laughs> so super to talk to you. Thank you. And hopefully um, we can, you know, find another conversation again. And I look forward to listening to the program more. It's fantastic what you're doing. Thank you so much, Alison. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you, Philip.